All right, without further ado, that's a little bit of the setup of what we're gonna talk about. So I have the privilege to be on stage here with three very fine gentlemen. Uh, Dave Malatesnek, the CIO, uh, VP of IT, uh, IT and owning, owning security, so dual, dual uh, role uh, at Hope Bridge, and I'll let, him, uh, let the group introduce themselves to start us out. Mitch Parker, uh, CISO at IU Health, and Phil Davis, uh, recently moved from Community Health Network as the CISO, and actually after we booked the panel, but I love the dual uh, impact that it will give for the panel, he's actually a, an attorney now at Hall Render, which is a healthcare-focused law firm. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic, we'll do quick introductions to get you to know them a little bit, and we'll dive right into the questions. Hey everyone, I'm Dave Malatesnik, as Aaron mentioned, um, lead the IT organization at Hope Ridge. Hope Ridge is uh, an organization actually just up the road here, um, got started in Kokomo, Indiana, and has evolved to the largest provider of therapy and services for children on the autism spectrum uh, in the United States. Um, we have uh, about 130 clinics um, that we focus on and, and uh, secure for our children and the families that we serve um, in 12 different states. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, as Aaron said, Phil Davis, uh, until about five weeks ago, was the CISO for Community Health Network uh, in Indianapolis. And a um, little background about community, uh, about 17,000 employees, uh, central Indiana-based uh, uh, healthcare network, about eight hospitals, uh, 250 other uh, various sites of care. Um, and now uh, serving in a, a a little bit different capacity at Hall Render. Hall Render is a healthcare focused firm, as Aaron uh, mentioned, uh, pretty much primarily healthcare clients, uh, based uh, headquartered here in Indianapolis, but offices all over, uh, all over the U.S. And uh, my practice there is, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, revolves around cybersecurity uh, law. So the the law of IT, uh, especially in healthcare, uh, IT and uh, the regulatory environment, contracts, third-party agreements, things like that, very, very tightly integrated, and um, certainly a lot of overlap, as I'm sure these uh, other three gentlemen can attest, between uh, healthcare IT and, and the legal realm. So uh, very happy to be here. Thank you all, as Aaron said, for staying, and uh, we're excited to, to get into the topic. All right, so I warned these gentlemen, I'm gonna ask them some tough questions, and I said don't sugarcoat it, because we've got a lot of students that are just getting into the field. These guys have been in the field for a while. They've gone through kind of the early days and learnings along the way. So I'm gonna start with a question on kind of, in some of your early establishment of cyber programs, what were some of the challenges that you faced as you were trying to emerge the program? Uh, how, you know, where did you face challenge in getting traction and then share with the group some of the tactics that you use to get that traction. Sure. So actually when I started um, at Hope Ridge just a few years ago, we had a security program, but more of a primitive security program. And uh, when I got started, it was the, the area of focus that I really need to, needed to uh, jump in on. Um, it became an exercise of change management at the end of the day. And you know, it's hard to go into um, your board or hard to go into your CEO and say, I need hundreds of thousands of dollars to um, shore up a security uh, posture. Um, what I ended up doing is, is went along the model of crawl, walk, run, and really started with, um, at, without asking for dollars for the crawl and walk piece. And I knew that there were a lot of things that we can do, but it was gonna be an impact to the entire organization um, of what we were gonna change. Um, once we got into each one of those phases, metrics were important, KPIs were important um, to show the value and to show what we were actually doing and how we were protecting uh, our children and the families we serve. Now when you start getting into the run phase, 
then that's when you can start asking for dollars. And, um, and it took a little while to get there, obviously, um, to get through the first two phases, but getting to that run phase then um, made it a lot easier because I had metrics. I had um, stories that I, anecdotal stories that you can tell. You, you started to see things in your ecosystem you've never seen before. And those um, became pretty critical um, as, you, as you started telling that story. Rich? So when I started in my current position, the organization <coughs> had a very tool-focused program, aka for every problem they had, there was a tool that fixed it. So one of the first things I did is I got a meeting with our chief operating officer and I talked about what was the root cause of security problems. And I said, everything we've looked at shows that the majority of security issues are actually have their roots in operations. So we're gonna treat security like a business problem because that's what it is. It's a problem for the business. I then repeated this in front of all of the hospital presidents and came right out and said, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a risk assessment because there are three things that the that the OCR, the Office for Civil Rights, will levy large fines for you if there's a data breach. So number one is no number one is no risk assessment, number two is no risk management plan, and number three is not following up. So we're going to start with a risk assessment. We then took the took the analytics from that, moved into a risk management plan, and then we moved into the hardest phase, which is following up. So the other challenge is that we faced have been number one facing the difference that security is not a, is continual it's not a project-based methodology and a lot of people in IT think in terms of projects which is when it's done you don't think about it well when it's done we have to think about it we have to maintain it take a look at a lot of the third-party data breaches out there a lot of the besides the ones that happen because of zero days a lot of them happen because people don't do something as simple as patch WordPress so we always have to think about how do you maintain systems and that's something a lot of people aren't used to so with us it was coming out saying it's a business problem talking about assessing addressing and treating it like the business problem that it is yeah and i can kind of piggyback off off both of those statements and in, in uh, to to get a little practical right as the, i guess as the legal uh, representative up here on uh, on the on the forum um, I, when we're talking about standing up security programs um, I want to I want to start with the basics essentially from you, you want to start with a good level of policies right policies that are documented because especially in healthcare and this is the case in in uh, practically any other industry the, there's a saying in uh, among legal circles that if you if you're not if it's not written down you're not doing it right so if you can't point to a policy that says here's how we go about solving any given problem if you can't point to evidence that it's happening then you can't get credit for it right in the legal realm and whether that's uh, you know avoiding fines or avoiding litigation or you know it, all of these um, troublesome outcomes from security uh, programs, if you don't have a good policy foundation laid, uh, then a, a lot of the work that, you, a lot of the good work that you do from the technology perspective, you, you, you may not get credit, as I mentioned for, in, in all of these legal forums. Um, and so that's kind of the, the advice that I would lay, is that make sure that the policies and the documentation is not, um, is not lost, right, as you're, as you're solving technical problems. Um, I think with healthcare, g given that we all are kind of in the healthcare space, uh, you've got things like HIPAA, right? You've got the HIPAA security rule, HIPAA privacy rule. All of that rests on your policy set. And um, as technologists, I think a lot of the times we resist the, uh, the documentation <laughs> aspect. We resist kind of the, the compliance exercise as just that, an exercise, a checkbox, right? Um, but it is important, uh, given that there are, you know, any manner of, of entities that would want to would want to come in and poke around your program, whether that's the government or um, you know uh, a plaintiff or a plaintiff's you know plaintiff's lawyer, uh, things like that. So 
that, that would be my, my advice when you're thinking about establishing a program because it's much easier to do uh, when you kind of have that blank space than it is to, to try and uh, look at your environment and then uh, on the back end try and, try and uh, make your policies align. Awesome, and just a quick story on that, really relevant for students, my, to Phil's point. My first job was at Eli Lilly, I was a developer. I wanted to cut code, I wanted to go fast, I wanted to build stuff. And I hated documentation, like with a passion. It was in pharma, so it was GXP, which means a lot, like times 10 documentation. Then I, my second role was in audit, and I saw where a lot of things broke down and controls were not effective. And I took from that role, and I wish I would have known earlier, hey, documentation doesn't have to be overkill, but learn what's important and learn how to do it very efficiently so you can avoid some of the things that Phil's alluding to. So in each of your examples, I think you all connected to something that wasn't there. So Dave, um, kind of the foundation and the storytelling, Mitch, reframing a technology problem to a business problem, Phil, writing down the basics so you can actually hold people accountable. So that kind of all connects to, there was a lack early on of leadership buy-in or awareness or just in general, it was an IT problem, not a business problem. So I'd like to pass the mic back this way this time, kind of talk about scenarios of how you gained executive support sponsorship and not only up front, but how did you maintain it as you were building things? And for the students in the audience, maybe you're not gonna be building a cyber program for a big company off the bat, but think about like communications and influencing on your first project. So I think we can draw parallels to some of these tips on at any level. Yeah, that, that's a good setup. Um, I love that there are so many students here because I, I think one of the things that I, that I wanna drive home is that out, out in the working world, relationships are everything. They really are. They're, they're, they're how you get jobs. They're how you succeed in jobs. They're how uh, you can solve problems uh, effectively and quickly is having good relationships built with those in your organization, but also those outside of your organization. Um, and so I really want to drive home the importance of, of being out there and being visible in your roles. It's very easy to, um, to, to, to show up to work, do your job, and then kind of clock out, right? But I think where a lot of the success that people uh, have comes from is their relationships and then, and then being visible and able to seize opportunities when they come about. And so where I'm going with that is um, you want to have very, very good relationships with the key stakeholders of your security program in your organization. I'm talking uh, compliance and privacy and risk and uh, internal audit if you have that function and being very intentional about rounding with those groups and having regular conversations and building relationships with them um, taking you know showing them news articles right of, of various things that are happening in the cyber realm all of those things over time build up to very good working relationships and that's how you really build buy-in uh, within an organization and get support for the cyber initiatives that we need to do that oftentimes are asking, uh, asking employees and staff to do extra things, right? Take another step to log in with multi-factor authentication instead of just putting in a password, right? If you're asking for things, it's good to have those relationships to build on and get support uh, to help you with those initiatives. Absolutely, and I will tell you Another big thing that I didn't learn, unfortunately, until I was in business school halfway through my career was bottom line up front. So the way I've done a lot of things to help get buy-in is number one, senior executives I deal with, they wanna know a couple things. First thing, why are you doing this? And the answer literally has to be one or two sentences. Also, who have you spoken with on my team? And finally, after that, have you been meeting their needs? So I had that with PCI compliance in my organization. I had the chief financial officer go to me, why are we doing this? And I had to give a very succinct answer of why PCI compliance was important. And every presentation I give to leadership always starts off with that first one sentence explanation, why are we here today? And also, what decisions do we need you to come to? So a lot of things for our friends in the MBA programs taught us work really well, so why are you here? Who have you worked with? 
what are your objectives, and what do you hope to accomplish, and how are you going to measure it? Or another one I like to say, what does good look like? So another big thing my team always does is we always determine what the metrics are and what good looks like because we have to be able to go, this is what we were hoping for, this has been our goal, this is what we've been able to accomplish. So we have everything organized with those metrics because we have to, that's the way the rest of the business world works. And people in the business world, there's a couple of things you have to realize. Number one, a lot of them do understand technology really well, and number two, they don't care. They want to see their numbers. So we've worked very hard to hone what I call the 30-second rule of getting all that out in 30 seconds in front of our senior execs. That way we can be more organized and help them make better decisions that are in the best interest of the organization. Yeah, there, there is, I, I was just in uh, one of the um, sessions and they were talking about uh, threat intelligence and there's a there's a concept that I use all the time called organizational intelligence. And it kind of hits on what uh, both uh, Mitch and Phil have been talking about is who in that organization are your supporters? Who are your detractors? And how do you, how do you really work with them? I mean, it's, it's, it's the age old motto of keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Um, that's how you have to navigate through it. Um, and you have to make it personal to them. Um, for, for our clinicians and some of our leaders, you know, having the conversation of, there's 100,000 children a month that get um, hit with identity theft. There's 500,000 predators um, on the internet at any point in time, right? We have a job to protect our children. I mean, that's what keeps me up at night anyways. And um, everything that we do comes back to the business side of it. It comes back to the children, it comes back to the families that we serve. And it's continuously reminding them we do things to serve our families. And um, the business side of it becomes very critical. I, I think the, especially in um, the cyberspace, the most sought out after um, uh, uh, resource that you look for or skill set that you want is a, sa a business savvy technologist. And it's somebody that can dissect and be curious enough from a business perspective that then can go solve from a technology perspective. And I think it's how do you become that business savvy technologist? How do you continue to learn to be um, that business partner along the way? Thanks, Dave. So I'm gonna combine a couple of questions, make, make it extra hard for these guys. So I wanna talk about risk management from two, two perspectives. One, risk and compliance. So we talked about HIPAA, we've talked about PCI. There's a lot of companies that, are, that need to adhere to some sort of regulation and they have tons of audits and all of a sudden, all they're doing is audits and paperwork. Required, important, but it also can dominate kind of not seeing the forest from the trees. So I want to talk about kind of how, how to have you guys balanced the compliance side of risk management and risk management from a threat landscape standpoint. And then also talk about connecting with the business risk and how, it, how it's not all about technology, but to some of the earlier comments, how are you really resonate risk management with what matters most for the business? So I have a quite unique um, use case. So in the um, behavioral therapy um, uh, space, uh, the, the turnover is quite high. Um, you're talking in, in ABA therapy, which is therapy for children on the spectrum, um, you're talking 70 to 90% turnover rate a year, okay? Um, it is a hard job. Um, it is very difficult. So we have to prepare for that failure. Um, we have a zero trust model um, that we put in place and we, I work quite closely with our compliance team on that zero trust model for the, the digital space, uh, the di digital piece. The other thing that we have had to do and we had to pivot quickly early on is um, come up with a risk tolerance policy. 
And that risk tolerance policy guides every decision that we make on the digital front. And when we have um, uh, challenges when someone leaves, when, when someone takes their device out the door, um, you know, how are those devices protected and what is our risk tolerance policy of what happens at that point in time, okay? So, so it those two things become critical as we manage through our business. It, it's really the zero trust model and it's the uh, risk tolerance policy. And so for us, I mean, we are governed by HIPAA and PCI in my organization because patient information is paramount and having trust and having our patients having trust on us is also paramount. So the way we've done it is risk assessments for us are part of business. And it's not just about checking the box on HIPAA or PCI because the regulators have gotten smarter. They want to see evidence that you're actually doing the work in the first place, especially with PCI. People's credit cards are very important, and we don't want to be on that list of vendors that violates that trust. So we take it incredibly seriously by incorporating assessments into business. We make it just regular routine business every time that every time, certain time of year, one of my team members will be contacting people in the business to say, it's that time again for the risk assessments. And the reason why we have to do it is to make sure we continue to protect patient information. And the way we talk about it is, it's everything we do is data driven in, in our team. And the way we can get in front of leadership and talk about it is to show them numbers of what's really going on. And What's more important than actually just doing assessments because just doing assessments means nothing will ever change and while you will be checking a box, you're doing a disservice to everyone in your organization and you're doing a big disservice to your customers. So real life example is we had an issue with our policies. We realized people didn't know what our policies were and we weren't communicating them well enough. And the ones we read, we had the lawyers going back and asking us questions, so we rewrote them all. And so very important for us to do because that directly came from the risk assessments. But again, you have to be continual, you have to be intentional, and more importantly, talk about the end in mind. What are you really doing? Why are you doing this? What is the organization going to get? Like PCI compliance, we got our latest, latest attestation of compliance and report on compliance from our third party auditor. It went to our senior leadership with the message, the team completed this work, our patients can now have that additional level of trust that we are protecting their information. And that's what we have to do. One to two sentences, 10 to 12 words to get the message across. However, to do so, you've got to make it part of business and talk about the vision of why. And why is this aligned back to the vision of the organization? How does this align for success? Because if you don't have that tie back, then it's additional work that people don't care about. You have that tie back and you understand why people are willing to fulfill the vision of the organization better. Yeah, I, lo I love that we're all kind of, <clears throat> I think circling around the same idea, right? And, and this is why I love being in healthcare. I love be being in the healthcare sector is that it is su such a mission driven sector. Um, not, not saying that other industries don't have this, uh, but I think it's to a special degree in healthcare where you have, you have patients, right? You don't have customers, you have patients. And, and all of us, as, as Aaron mentioned at the beginning, are patients, know patients, uh, have parents that are patients and family members that are patients. And, it's, and I think it really drives home uh, with cybersecurity because the cyber, the cyber community is such a protective community by nature, right? By virtue of what we do, we are, we are protectors. And when you're protectors of kids and patients and you know, the elderly, right? These vulnerable communities that healthcare serves, um, it's, it's a really easy mission to get behind. And bringing it back to the question about compliance and kind of how you reconcile cybersecurity and like the engineering pursuits of cybersecurity with the compliance side, um, I, I honestly, I think that there's a really big opportunity, uh, especially in healthcare, but any other regulated industry uh, would be the same banking, uh, utilities, right? Any of these critical infrastructure 
industries that you hear about. I think GRC is a huge opportunity to get into right now, to have people who understand the technology, but also uh, want to ensure that things are done the right way in a compliant manner, and who get the GRC processes uh, that are that are really developing because every organization needs this and I think that there's there's a dearth of, of, of people who really are drawn to that compliance side of things but it is so important right it's so critical to the mission of healthcare organizations to maintain the trust of our patients and of the communities that uh, healthcare entities serve uh, and so I, I did just want to put the plug in there for for GRC tracks, uh, it, it, it's, it's really catching fire in, in industry. And we were just talking, uh, a few of us uh, before this, about GRC software platforms and kind of where they're at in their infancy. And it's an area that I think all regulated industries are focusing more on, especially within cyber. And um, there's a lot of opportunity there to, to be had. So Phil, you mentioned that cyber industry as a whole is very protective, and I totally agree with you. We are protecting things that we deal with, our business, our customers, our kids, our parents. On the flip side, um, since I've been in this industry, I've also noted that it's a very sharing community, collaborating, not reinventing the wheel. So I wanted to ask a question about how do you, at this point in your career, stay connected across platforms, conferences like this, other mechanisms to stay current, but also learn from your peers so you're not reinventing the wheel. Yeah, I, I think everybody who's here has is starting from a leg up, right? Because you're 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 in an, an environment that that fosters collaboration. And in cybersecurity, my uh, my read on it has been that the the more you are connected to others in other organizations and other industries even uh, the more you can bring back to your role and your job because uh, you now have knowledge that uh, you wouldn't have had otherwise. And so going to events like this, it, I, I've always uh, made it a point to, to be at events like this and, and participate in the community as much as I can because it is so valuable. And like I mentioned before, networking is everything. And you know, when you hear the word networking, maybe you're an introvert like I am, and you're like, oh, I don't know about that, that that's not for me. Um, but networking is not about um, you know, being an extrovert and being a social butterfly. It's, it's about um, having a common shared interest with, with, with uh, somebody else who's probably in a similar spot to you at another organization, or um, you know, reaching out to peers for uh, a lunch, uh, conversation once a month or once a quarter. And it's really about just having that network of people that you can draw from and go to with questions. Maybe you don't want to go to your boss with a question because you think, oh, well, you know, they're going to think I should already know that, right? It's having those, those other outside uh, sources that you can go to to bounce ideas off of and ask questions. And uh, I think that's how we all get better. Absolutely. And sitting next to someone who I talked a lot with when he was in his previous role. So shows you the value of this. And again, once you get in there, every, it's everything about what you do with the community. And the reason why is a lot of companies that are out there don't understand much about security. A lot of them have nascent cybersecurity programs. So you make connections with your peers. You go to Vegas in August to hang out at DEF CON. You go and hang out over at, at Black Hat and you learn from your peers there. It's very important to just keep continually learning because the structure for continuing education that's in cybersecurity is now nowhere near as mature as it is for accounting and insurance. And accounting and insurance aren't as fun. So it's very important to keep connected with your peers and to keep continually learning, keep finding people with the same interests, and keep challenging each other, keep meeting up, and keep working at this, because nobody who's in this field took a, took a formal CPA exam to get here. Everyone had to work and learn on their own, and that do-it-yourself tradition is continuing to evolve, and especially at the CISO level. I will also say that it is an expectation of my organization's senior leadership and board of directors 
that I also have this because it evolves at my level from just going to conferences to working on standards and collaborating with others because one of the big questions senior executives ask when you put a big project in is who else has done this and have you talked to them? And usually I like to preempt that with this is who I've talked to, this is what we're working on, these are the partnerships that we have and this is how we learn and this is how we learned about this because either they're going to ask me to do it or I'm going to do it proactively and I'd rather do it proactively because it helps them make a better decision. If they have to ask me a question about who I collaborated with or how I found this out, they're less likely to support the decision. So what you learn now about collaborating with others, keep doing it because what's going to happen is when you get senior enough, it's an expectation, not something that's just nice. Yeah, just, uh, just to add on to that, um, you know, the, this cyberspace, in this cyberspace, um, we all look at ourselves as allies, not competitors. So no matter what company we're from, um, whether we're from the same industry, whether we're, we're, we compete from a, a, a patient population perspective, we don't care when it comes to cyber. Um, we're all allies in this together. Um, the one thing that I would um, challenge you all with is putting together a visibility program for yourself. And a visibility program um, is really looking at all of the networks of individuals that you come in contact with. Um, people at the grocery store are a network that you come in contact with. Um, uh, people at your churches, people at, um, at third parties, those are all individuals part of your visibility program. And how do you leverage them in conversations? How do you leverage a conversation when you're in line at a grocery store um, talking to somebody and then finding out that uh, they have something in common with you? So it's, it's not uh, just going out and networking, but it it's, could be simpler than that. It's those that you come in contact with every day and just, just mark those groups. Um, I, have, I had groups with my kids, uh, their uh, uh, tailgate groups where we would go tailgate with the parents. And that's a whole different network for me as well that I can get information out of. So get creative with it and, um, and expand that network, but really, really I challenge you to create that visibility program because it becomes critical and, and you'll see in that program that there are more connections that you have than you realize that you really do. All right, this last question and preview before I open it up for you all to ask questions and make sure they're hard, because I've been hard, but they got some intel on what I was gonna ask them. So think about your questions. But my question, I'm gonna ask them to do it in one sentence. If you were to take anything out of this conference today, using the wisdom from these three guys here, what would your parting thoughts be, one sentence or less? Um, security is a business problem, not an IT, uh, not an IT issue. Continual improvement is, is the goal. I'll break this down. I'll, I'll go with a uh, kind of a, a, a career advice aspect. This is, the, this is a preface. <laughs> Lawyers have to be verbose. I think everybody knows that. Uh, f find your differentiator, what makes you unique, what makes you uh, stand out from the rest of the crowd. Find that differentiator about you, whether it's an interest that you have or uh, something you're passionate about within the cyber uh, realm. Find that differentiator and then be visible in your organization with that. I don't think there was a period in that sentence, but it was quite the lawyer <laughs> soliloquy if I have to say myself. All right, so let's open it up to questions. Again, if one of these guys winces or cries because you've asked them such a, such a tough question, that's okay. They're, they're, they're senior, they know how to deal with that. All right, any questions? Got one up top. Just uh, very simple. Uh, by the way, go Isaac, go. Yeah. <laughs> it's other blocks. It was mentioned about EHI as one of the core of the health industry. Uh, we recently saw a very bad breach, one of uh, Patrick Body that had that. So what I wonder is what is your what is your strategy when you know that EHI 
IP divided in probably four firms. Uh, you have hospital network, you have insurance company, you have health app. In general, the people have either cell phone or a phone, and you have government side. All of these have my EHI. So who is to blame? Who is accountable? How to protect that? What do you think or what do you do to protect your network, your company from that? Thank you. All right, guys, he had four sub bullets. I'm going to run back down here. I'm getting all my steps today. Who wants to take it? All right, Mitch has got it. So one of the big things that every organization needs is an excellent third party risk program because for each of those four sub bullets you named, every single one of them has their own data protection strategies. They all have to be evaluated and they all have to be evaluated to applicable criteria. Now the one out of the four that you mentioned that is actually the, probably the most secure I've dealt with ironically are the health insurance companies. They have the most secure standards of anyone I've dealt with. Goes from there down to government, because government's actually pretty good about their standards, but some of them fall a little bit behind. When you start getting out of federal and going more to state and local, they're a little bit further behind. Third party, other hospitals, it's a mixed bag. Smaller hospitals are not very good and they need a lot of education. Larger hospitals have their pockets where they're really good. However, the one where I found the most issues has actually been the third party vendors that supply the industry. The, they need a lot of work and they need a lot of education and a major component of the third party risk program that we run happens to be about education for a lot of both small healthcare providers and also the third party vendors to explain this is why you need to do this. Not here's a big questionnaire to fill out that's gonna make you wanna hate me. It's about, we ask you to do this. And I have these phone calls on a regular basis with my vendors. This is why we need to do this. This is why integration with identity management is important. And I have repeated the words, identity management is important and single sign-on is important because that means one last password that is stuck on a post-it note put on someone's monitor. So these are all things we have to do. And again, it's about having a program that evaluates the risk. And more importantly, if there is an issue, doing that root cause analysis, because nowadays the expectation isn't that, oh yeah, we recovered from this breach. I get the question, well, Mitch, what did you do? And it will come from people that can fire me if I give the wrong answer. So. I like to say, this is a root cause analysis, this is what we did, this is why we did it, because nowadays the, the C-suite is so attuned to data breaches and so attuned to third party vendor risk that they wanna know what, they're just gonna come, come right out and go, unless you tell me exactly what you did, if I have to draw it out of you, there's a problem. So this has happened to me, it's happened to me enough times, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. I'm just going to add to that real quick. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if there's a breach, um, our patients are coming at us, Hope Rich. They're not coming at um, our suppliers. Now, there is still um, joint accountability because the supplier does have accountability. Um, and, and that's what Mitch was talking about. We actually do, we have a third party program, as do. Um, as does IU Health, but we do regular pen tests against our uh, third party suppliers. And so we can see where their vulnerabilities are um, and, uh, and, and we have with those programs in our contracts that they have to um, uh, work on uh, mutually agreed upon uh, remediation plans um, with us. So, so contractually we're, we're tied with that as well. Who wants to be one of Dave's third parties? He's going to hack you. All right, we've got a question up here. I'm going to run again. I'm going to sweat. So I have a question I'm from a legal standpoint, and it is a little bit of a complex question. It's a two-parter. Given uh, the increasing prevalence of state-sponsored cyber attacks, which we have learned today, um, and the evolving landscape of international cybersecurity law, 
what legal frameworks and precedents exist to address cross-border cyber incidents, and how can my organization, as I work as a non for a nonprofit uh, health organization, uh, proactively navigate the legal complexities to protect our assets and maintain compliance with relevant laws and regulations? Was that an original? It was <laughs> ChatGDP? Oh, that was good. That was good. All right. Mitch, Dave, put your hands down. This one's going straight to Phil. <laughs> fantastic question. Fantastic question. Um, so I would, I'm going to start out by saying, uh, I don't know what industry you're in, but I'm willing to bet that there is an ISAC community for your industry, an information sharing and analysis center. So for healthcare, there's the health ISAC. For banks and financial services, there's the FS, financial services ISAC. Those are, uh, those are industry organizations that partner with our federal government to uh, foster information sharing and really put, it, it puts a spotlight on these international state-sponsored uh, cybercrime uh, syndicates that where we can have a relationship established as organizations, we can have that relationship established with our government ahead of time uh, most of the time, the FBI is involved in these uh, ISACs. Um, Department of Defense is involved. The military generally has a presence as well. And um, I think that helps uh, bolster the organization's standing if they are a target by a state-sponsored uh, actor. On the legal side of things, um, I generally... I, I don't think that the, the fact that it's a nation state or a state sponsored actor, it generally does not change any part of the legal obligations of, of an incident. Regardless of if it's someone US based, uh, you know, the classic hacker in their basement that, that's getting into your systems, from the legal side of things, it's the same laws that are uh, applicable, it's the same breach notification rules, it's the same. Uh, uh, for healthcare, the same HIPAA breach risk analysis that has to happen to determine if you've got a reportable event, right? So I think from the legal side of things, it, it, it's, it's, it's fairly consistent incident to incident regardless of who, is, who it is attacking you. That's why I think it is so important to have relationships established in government, even if you're not a government, uh, if you don't work for a municipality, if you're working just in a, in a, in a company, in a US-based organization to have these partnerships, have these contacts that you can readily reach out to in the FBI, in these ISAC communities. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts too. Uh, absolutely, so as Phil mentioned about the ISACs, that's very critical. Also, the FBI in our experience has been excellent to work with and, being, and advising on many of these issues. However, due to the large international nature and Give you, and I'll just give you a preview, as part of my job, I deal with a lot of business all over the world. And groups that are, a, that are considered terrorists in the United States are political parties in other countries. So there's a lot of considerations if you do business internationally, and the best advice I can give you is talk to Phil or his firm or a firm like his if you're doing business, any business internationally because there are different data breach laws depending on the country that you do business with. And you, and I will also tell you there's a lot of it depends and there's a lot of caveats you have to watch out for from when doing business internationally. So always having good legal counsel that can advise you of what goes on in each country and how you can be compliant because GDPR is only one thing to worry about. It's also taking a look at other countries that might have more lax data breach laws than the United States because, to be very blunt, someone from Russia attacks you. U.S. government does try to follow up. I've talked to the Secret Service about this. However, when they follow up, Russia takes the warrants and either shreds them or offers the people jobs. And again, not my words, words of the U.S. Secret Service. So when you think about all this, it's about having good networks, having people in state, local, and federal government in your networks, and also doing business internationally, having really good lawyers. Nice. Got a plug in there. That's nice, Phil. All right, uh, let's see. How are we doing on time? 
We'll do one last question and then we will wrap. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time and sharing your wealth of knowledge with all the camps to express that appreciation. Uh, we've talked a lot about legal and regulatory compliance, HIPAA, PCI, and there are also ISO standards, GDPR, the California Data Privacy Act, the international controls. When dealing with organizations that have to answer to so many rule sets, um, there's a high likelihood that they are in conflict with each other. How is that addressed in the healthcare space when you're dealing with not just the sensitivity of information technology, but also operational technology? And at the end of the day, people's lives. All right, nine regulatory references. Who wants that one? That's a good question. <laughs> So I can provide a very quick answer for that. Uh, we and my organization use ISO as a, are moving towards using ISO as a base because what we found about all those regulatory sets that you talked about, almost everything bases on ISO, even down to IoT. And whatever ISO doesn't cover, IEEE does a pretty good job of covering. So there's emerging standards. I'm actually, caveat, I am working on one of the joint security standards for IEEE and UL for IoT security. And I can tell you the standard that I'm working on directly maps to ISO. And what I've found in doing all this work in standards compliance and writing books on the subject has been that if you go with ISO 27001, 27002 as a base, especially the 2022 revision, and plug in other ISO standards and IEEE as necessary, you can address a lot of your IoT security needs. Yeah, just to wrap that up briefly too, from the legal side of things, the nice thing is, and to nerd out not to nerd out too much here, but the nice thing on, on at least the US-based privacy laws is most of them have a carve out to say that if you're subject to HIPAA or a similar uh, federally uh, mandated privacy law, it carves you out of applicability. And so like for CCPA and you know, things like that, GDPR is a little bit different. Um, for, the, for the most part, you, your, your healthcare organizations you know, that are delivery organizations are not subject to GDPR for the most part for the most of their patients. However, some of the you know, patients are from Europe. Um, but there are, you may have different environments. You may have different you know, carved out technology environments for uh, European customers versus US customers. But um, those are the two of the, the caveats that I would offer there. And I can also just add one other thing about GDPR. GDPR also does have a public health exception carve out. Look at that, three responses and they were wrestling for the mic. That's a good question, man. good job. All right, well, with that, I'd just like to wrap up, say thank you for the panelists for having a really good conversation. Thank you for the audience for having really good questions. Thank you for staying on a Friday afternoon. Uh, at least it wasn't sunny outside, so you're not missing anything. So have a great weekend. I'm gonna turn it back over for the rest of the conference. Thank you.